challenges, some of the opportunities. And I also want to make reference to one point that Jeff made at the, um, in his question uh, during the dinner uh, last night or after the dinner, which is, <clears throat> excuse me, dealing with, are we going to grow the pie? Uh, this is my interpretation of what you were saying. Are we going to grow the pie or are we just going to simply worry about how we're going to divide it? In other words, are we going to do something differently to be able to provide the experience that uh, we're looking at uh, within the air travel industry all over the world. So I am going to try and address that issue. The last point that I want to make before the physical slides come up is I've spent a lot of time in the last 15 or so years looking at what are the best global business practices. Not only what are the best, but what are the next global business practices and what insights can they provide for the airline industry. Now, whether the others are products or services or some combination, but are there any messages that we, within the aviation industry, which includes airports, or just the airline industries, can we gain some insights from that? So I am going to take you on a little bit of a different tangent uh, than some of the discussion that took place yesterday to see if I can give you a broader view of where I see the air transportation industry going. So with that background, uh, let me go on. I, I guess I'm going to have to learn how to work this part of it here. Okay, the, uh, the, the part is the end game. We have to learn to make money consistently during economic cycles, during the crises that come up. And of course, the crisis, there's no end to it. It's just one crisis after another. And, and the thing about the price of the fuel going up, to me, that's not a new thing. I mean, it happens all the time. It goes up and it comes down, down again. Who knows? We may see $200. We may see $80. I have no idea. But that's the whole point. We've got to learn to plan for that. So the, the uh, agenda that I've been asked to talk about is that how do we make money? I maintain that the way we're going to make money is not only customer-centric innovation, but it is exemplified by the merchandising models that we have just begun. We have just begun that. This ancillary revenue, that's just scratching the surface of that. If we really want to become merchants, then we have to be able to do what is going on in that wall. That's been going on for a lot longer than the last few years. There's a lot we can learn from the merchandisers if that's the direction we want to go. The other part I want to talk about here is this customer centricity. Where is an airline who's not going to admit that we're customer service? Of course they say we're customer service. To me, that is just lip service. We've got a long way to go. We don't know much about our customers at all. And, and one of the speakers yesterday uh, uh, said that uh, he has two personalities. He's one type of a customer during five days of the week, and then he's another type of a customer uh, during the weekend. Well, let me tell you, I, you, you have no idea how many personalities I have. And every time I change my personality, I'm a different customer. And in fact, even on the day that I have this personality, I'm a business person, let's say, I have two personalities even on that day. The flight that I'm going out to make this business meeting is a different person than the flight coming back after the meeting is done. This is how sophisticated we've got to get to the information to be able to cater to the needs of the customer. Keep those things in mind. Why do I think that there is a need for different models? There's a whole reason, you know, it's unacceptable ROI, which we've talked about, I'm not going to spend any more time, and in case you're not familiar with some of those words, that's the weighted cost of capital. So the difference between the weighted cost of capital and the return on invested capital, that gap is not narrowing to the point that we need to narrow. So that's one. Two is that there are more powerful internet uh, marketing uh, techniques that are coming up virtually by the day. We can't keep up with these. Another point that was made yesterday is that uh, somebody mentioned that if there's more than 20 minutes between the time that an operational problem has occurred and the airlines and the president knows about it, that's 20 minutes is too long uh, in, in, the, in the environment that we're talking about. So that's the second reason. 
The third reason is that there are new, very powerful competitors coming in, and whether they're based in the Persian Gulf or whether they're based in China, uh, they are more powerful, they may have more money, uh, they may be working with the greenfield models or both, and then of course the expansion of the low-cost carriers, uh, Pacific, particularly in the Asia-Pacific region, which is right now less than Europe and uh, North America, but it's growing, so there are new and powerful competitors that are coming in. And last but not least is that uh, don't underestimate the ordinary customers. They are becoming very, very powerful, all enabled by emerging technology. The emerging technology is not just simply uh, the mobile phones that we carry are now more powerful, uh, more sophisticated, more timely, give us all kinds of information, but the social media, the fact that they are connected to social media. So all of these factors are leading us to, we need to change our business model. We are changing it. My point, we're not changing it fast enough. That's the problem that I see. What do we need to do to move further on? Well, the customer's shopping experience is really a disaster. It takes hours, whether you're a business person or a leisure traveler, to get on the internet and do things. They're not coordinated, I've got to go to multiple sites. And then, of course, the new thing is navigating through these tack-on fees is really becoming a serious issue. The, the, the whole idea of retail orientation, we are trying to be retailers, but we don't really understand, we the airline don't really understand how the retailers work. And, 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 and I was only given 20 minutes, but I would need about an hour and a half to go into details of how. I'll just leave it at the point uh, with you. We talked about brand at the dinner time last night. There are very few, if any, brand-driven products and services that are offered by airlines. Yes, there are some people who claim that they have brand names, whether it's Singapore Airlines or, or Virgin Atlantic or uh, uh, Southwest and so on. Yes, they do have brand. There's no question about it. I'm not denying it. But are they really driven the brand-driven products what we're looking for for which customers are willing to pay? That's the issue that I'm... Uh, Raising. I think we're going to be getting copies of these, so I won't take detailed uh, uh, comments at this stage. Let me take you on a different uh, area for a minute. A typical business goes through what I would call an S-curve. You know, there's the beginning, and then there's the middle, and there's towards the end of it, uh, in, in terms of they've reached the maturity. Let's take some examples of how this S-curve works in a different industry, and then we'll come back to the airline industry. In the computer area, if you remember, we used to be working with the, uh, the DOS things on computers. The interface was very difficult. If I had to move something, I didn't have this little mouse to work with. I used to be able to have press certain keys to interface. Then came up the, the Apple generation where they developed a much better interface to work with. Then they moved on to the screen. But you notice each one of them is on a different S curve. So instead of trying to improve what you already have, so instead of the Microsoft people saying instead of spending three keys to copy something, you only have to press one, that's working on the same curve, doing a little bit better. You just move on to a different S curve altogether. That's what I'm talking about. Let's say, what did Apple do? Apple started the, the computer, which was very user-friendly. They made it even more user-friendly, higher capacity, cheaper, and then they changed the design of it. But it is still on the same S curve. At the end of that, they decided now it's time to move to a new S curve. And that's where they took off from where the computers were and developed the iTunes, the iPod, the iPhone, the iPad, and so forth. Every one of them is more customer-centric it is driven by technology. It is raising the state of the art in the area that we want to move. By doing that, what were they able to achieve? They were able to achieve integration. Look at the second part. Where am I? Look at the second part here. System of products and applications and partnerships, the iTunes. I'm going to spend a minute on this, even if it, I go over time on this. On my mobile phone, if I want to download a particular tune for 99 cents, I can download it. 
Do I worry about, do I have the permission to do it? Who sang the song? Which company produced the record? Who, which lawyers? I don't care. I just want the song. 99 cents. Let Apple do all the integrations with all the suppliers, all the vendors, everybody. That's, that's their problem. That is what I'm talking about. I just want to be able to get it on there. You see where I'm going to go with on that on the airlines? I don't want to talk about airports and air traffic controls and securities and airlines. I just want to get from A to B fat. You guys do the integration. There's an example of where I'm going. So what did they do after that? They personalized it. Put these songs on the iPod for me in this order and play it this way. Then what happens? Mobility. I can take it anywhere I want. Design of it. And the last part is not loyalty, but commitment. Commitment means, can I only buy Apple? I, I'm a shopper. I can buy anything I want. But I'm going to stay with Apple. Why? Because I have the iPod, I have the iPhone, I have the iPad. I'm committed to Apple. I'm with Bank of America. Legally, am I not allowed to go to a different bank? I can go anywhere I want. But my account is there, my investments are there, my kids' education thing is there, my credit card is there. I'm committed to that bank. I'm committed to Apple. Am I committed to a particular airline? Mm -mm. Mm -mm. I told you we're going to have to go and look at best practices. Where are we going? Let's go to the airlines. So what is happening in airlines? Now, did airlines do nothing at all? Did they not innovate? Not at all. They have been very innovative in some areas, starting with, you know, and I've lived through all of these. I'm old enough to have lived through all of that. In fact, even long prior to that. Computer reservation systems, hub and spoke systems, frequent fire programs, revenue management, global alliance, and so on and so on. And it was pointed out to me a little bit earlier that whereas the Apple thing was all about products, these are services. Some of these services are back office services, agreed. Some of those services are not, like the life and beds and so on. So we have done that. My question, having been in this industry now for almost 45 years, is that question mark right there. Where are we going now? Where we, as an entire industry, not just a particular airline, not just low cost carriers, full service carriers, hybrid, doesn't matter. Where are we going as an industry next? Are we simply going to fine tune it, make it a little bit better of what we are doing, or are we going to try and do something differently to increase the size of the pie? Not just take a bigger share of that. Not just the low cost carriers trying to be a little bit more about the full service carrier, trying to go after the business travelers and the other ones coming this way. Or are we going to do something different? That question is what I'm talking about. And again, putting it in the context of the Apple example that I gave earlier, yes, we used to go from airport to airport, then we had third-party distributions coming in, we had digital access and mobile and so on, right up there. But we haven't got down to that commitment level that Apple got to. In general, I'm not committed. Yes, there are certain cities in the US if I live in, and if 85% of the flights out of that city are on one airline, then yes, I am committed to go on that. That's because I have no choice. No choice. They're the only ones supplying, supplying 60, 70, 80, I don't know, Jeff, I think some of them are up to about 85% of the departures out of that are with, with one carrier. Am I committed to that? And how do I get committed? Let's spend a few minutes. And yes, I am coming towards the end of my presentation too. What are we committed? I think that right there is where is the, the spectrum of the business models changing. There are airlines who could think about going to this end of it, providing personalized service, providing customized, worrying about the travel experience. We, we, we could go towards that end of it. You know, British Airways, the Uniteds, the Deltas, the, the Cathay Pacific, you know, they, they, they could go in that direction. There's the other direction, which is absolutely rock bottom prices. The Ryanairs, uh, the Spirits, the Allegiances, and possibly Air Asia. 
we, we could go in that direction. And then, of course, there are in between. There is no such thing, I see, as a business model. There are business models and different ones for different categories. This is, is, is the area that I think that we need to be uh, looking at. But in order for us to get there, at the upper end, this whole idea of customer experience is where, where we are. And we, are, we haven't even begun to scratch the surface of what customer experience is all about. It is because, very important, you talk to an airline, you name the airline, anyone you want, they're really trying, they really are trying to do their best in terms of customer experience. What's the problem? They're doing it in a very compartmentalized comp manner, meaning everything that I do, and then there's an airport over here trying to do the same thing, doing the very best that they can, but right here, right? And then there's maybe the air traffic control system, maybe the transportation security, whatever it is. What's missing? What's missing is the integration across all of those to improve the totality of the customer experience. That is what I'm talking about. That is what Apple did, is the totality of the customer experience. Whether it's the design of the unit, or even the box that it comes in, or coordinating it with other members in the supplier chain, is the totality. That's where the innovation needs to come. And in some of my questions later, I'm going to uh, reflect that. So what are the challenges to do that? The challenges are, there's this the conventional hurdles. You know, my IT system won't do that. I have labor contract. Uh, you know, I have uh, uh, airport facilities that won't cooperate in there. So, okay, fine, conventional uh, hurdles. There's the conventional thinking. Price, price, price. When we advertise, how many airlines would say that, no, 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 I know my price is higher, but this is why, because I provide this service over here. It's not just a flat bed, but it's a horizontal bed. It has a plug-in for your computer, so you need to pay more plug -in. We need to, uh, to go away from the price and talk about value. And then, of course, we are challenged by the fact how much information the customers have in terms of social security, uh, social uh, technology. Those are the, some of the challenges. How about some of the opportunities? The opportunities, the biggest opportunity, I think, is in terms of thinking non-conventionally. We have always, we define the customer standards. We think that this is what the customers want. Who the heck is we? Do we ask people, yeah, 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 I do surveys and I do focus groups and all that. That's old stuff. Now you gotta get my information in real time at, 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 on a position-based basis. Where I am at that time, what's happening that I've got to give you the information? You don't have that. So you need to, to think very unconventionally. Where are the high margin areas? It's not flying airplanes. The margins on flying airplanes are minimal. The real profit is made in other areas. If I had more time, I could show you some graphs that would really open your eyes on where the real money is. It is not in flying airplanes. But you said, well, then can we stop flying airplanes? <laughs> you have to fly airplanes. You have to go to the airport. But that's not where the money is. The money is in different areas. So look for where that is. Integrate within the supply chain. Build brands and branding that we have not even begun to do that along the lines of the major global companies. You know, there's a lot to be learned. And, and some of the airlines, they are moving in that direction. And, and, and as I said, you know, we had one yesterday here. JetBlue that's doing it, and of course Virgin Atlantic has always had a decent brand, and uh, Singapore Airlines, but there are far and few in between, right? And then of course we've got to learn from what the, um, the real gurus in there are doing. So, the last slide, or almost one to the last, where, what about other opportunities? Deploying transformative technologies. There are technologies that we can use to not only get more business intelligence, but more consumer intelligence. I need to explain the difference. Business intelligence is information about a customer. Customer intelligence is information for the customer. If I'm about to click in the US that yes, I'll take this, this uh, reservation I'm about to make, there should be a message right there. 
Are you sure you want to take that connecting flight? Is that a Detroit airport in the middle of January and you got 40 minutes to connect it? We highly recommend that you take the one before that. Are they legally saying you can? Of course not. Get information for the customer. There are stores where you're now scanning items and, and the information is coming up. The sugar content of that is pretty high. Do you want that much? And let me decide, oh wow, with the diabetes problem I have, I better not take this box right here. See what I mean? Are they forcing you not to take that? It's, it's information for the customer, not about the customer. We in the airline don't even have information about the customer to the degree that I'm talking about, let alone more over there. This is what I'm talking about, getting into the retailing business. If you want to be there, man, data warehousing, data mining, data drilling, data analytics, data predictive analysis. That's exactly the information American Express has on you based on the card that they're using. It is incredible. We're not there yet. So I do think that there are opportunities out there that we can go on. So what is the end game in changing uh, the uh, uh, making profit on that? Innovations in business models, transformational, they have to be transformational, not incremental, but transformational in different sense for a low cost carrier that's going to the rock bottom prices, a la Spirit, a la Ryanair, that's one kind of a transformational change. Another one is personalized service, door to door service, door to door service, that would be at the other end. Accessing and connecting passengers, accessing and connecting, that word connecting, not just internally, but through airports, using information and technologies, integrated operations across the whole value chain. That, I maintain, is how you're going to be able to make profit. Thank you very much. With that, uh, I would like to, um, how do you want me to, uh, the panelists are, okay, the, uh, the panelists that uh, we have here, if they could uh, come and step up here. Uh, Christoph Mueller from uh, Aer Lingus, uh, Teros Taskila from Estonia Airlines, uh, Kair Mirza, Malaysian Airports, uh, Lim Kim Hai from Regional Express Airlines, and uh, Ilya Gutman from CETA. focus of their attempt was to have maybe a mechanic there, 
able to change a light bulb or to, to, to clean the, the windscreen and so on and so forth. That was their raison d'etre to run a gas station. Today it's a byproduct. Today a gas station makes money with retail. To run a gas station today effectively requires a retail manager, not a mechanic. And I believe 90% of the time in airline conferences is still devoted to the fact how to run a gas station, not to run a retail shop. And that's the reason why, I mean, your analogy with the customer, um, we are focused still around the PNR, which is a very, very limited code to capture information what we believe about the customer, but it's, it's basically um, very short-lived because once the flight is done, the PNR is gone. So we do not even capture the data. We haven't made the step to the CNR, the customer name record, which would enable you, like almost a permanent uh, RFID, to capture the data and enrich it, and your, your Apple example is quite good. I would like to have a permanent CNR with all airlines in the world capturing my favorite playlist from my iTunes, uh, the favorite movies, in order to, when I get my seat, which is always the same, uh, 2A, it is uploaded on, 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 the, uh, on, on the device. I can even use my personal device. All that, I believe, is more um, important for us, for the airlines, so I, I believe merchandising or retail or however you call it is the next step um, in, in, in our life cycle. The, the flying from A to B will become a byproduct similar to the modern gas station, selling gas. Yeah. Anyone else like to add any comment? Yes. Yeah, I think, um, well, having this world and also the world you, what you presented and comparing the airlines to the Apple, would be that the only way we can achieve the commitment is that we are one single global alliance. Mm -hmm. Because part of the Apple, uh, uh, sort of, uh, the, why they are so successful is that they are all, every time they are with you, and they have this portfolio of products and services, what you like to have. And uh, the small airline, although we are very small airline, and we are so small that you can even uh, carry us in a pocket, almost. So the, but we will never be a small one. So, the, and you already mentioned as well that the, you have airports where you have 85% uh, the capacity by one single airline. You choose them because you have to, but why don't you choose the 15%? Mm -hmm. And that's the dilemma what we have in, with the airlines everywhere. And especially with smaller airlines like we are, we are not, never able to create a seamless brand product with the current, uh, current systems. We have different second systems in Stockholm, we have a different in... Uh, uh, in, the, uh, in Tallinn or in London and so forth. And because we are small, we never are able to influence to change that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. From, I guess yeah. from an IT provider's perspective, um, when, when we look at the industry, when we look at the airports, for example, I mean, there, there, there are a lot of people quipping saying that airports are becoming shopping centers with a runway attached to them, which is true. But at the same time, if you look at the IT system, if you look at the amount of information that the airports have, on their consumers, it's very limited right now. They are starting to go into um, into tracking passengers and to see how much passenger, how much time the passengers spend in certain shops. Which shops will make money? Why do customers uh, spend time there? We're looking as a provider. We're looking at three different technologies. Um, one is uh, Bluetooth, but Bluetooth is more of an operational system. Uh, it uh, helps you control your queues and security control your queues in immigration and one of the large European airports when they looked at their queues they saw that um, 10 minutes, 10 extra minutes in a queue in security could drive their retail revenues down by 30%. Now that's Bluetooth Wi-Fi for example which is another technology that we're looking at that really is for dwell time and currently we're working with Sydney we're installing Wi-Fi there and they really want to track um, they want to track their passengers, how much time they're spending in there. And if you hear Max talking uh, about seating, for example, he goes, no way am I going to be putting comfortable seats in my airport. I want my passengers to be walking around. I want them to be shopping. But again, how much, how much information do we have on the 
Third technology is really operational. It's barcode and boarding pass there. You get 100% of, uh, of your passengers. You know exactly who passed security. You know that they're at the airport. You know that you should make a second last call because to, to un offload his bag and to delay the flight uh, is probably worth it rather than reflighting the person afterwards. I think, uh, first of all, just to thank uh, Peter and Kappa. Um, for inviting, I think, probably the only airline, uh, airport person to this conference. Um, so I've tried to stay a little bit quiet uh, over the first uh, day, listen to a few people. And I think I'm very happy that you brought up those points about um, how we basically do our business, we go about our business, and the approach that we take whether it's product-oriented, brand-oriented, price-oriented, and so on. And I'm very happy that you brought up the point about should we look at it as a retail opportunity, a retail offering, a consumer offering. And that's, to me, that's precisely the point. Um, not to say that it's an airport perspective, but the point is, it's not just a retail or supermarket or hypermarket or grocery store um, concept that we have to move towards to better meet consumer needs. It's really every other type of company has actually catered their products and services a little bit better, a little bit more in detail, a little bit more using the analytics available and the data available, and just doing it. You know? So I, I would even go one step further to say, look, it's not about seeing what the the supermarkets of the world have done and how they do it better. It's not about how the infrastructure companies like the gas station, for example, has done and doing it similarly. It's really reviewing and taking one step back and thinking how have we how have we have we how, how have we strategized about our business? How do we actually treat our customers? How do we treat our business partners, and how do we use all of the data available, not just with us, but with all of them. Now, if I may just go a little bit further, just to use that example with the gas station, right? Now, if I remember correctly, in Australia, what Shell did was, Shell said, look, my ROA, my ROI is in the single digit number, and it's not improving. Prices are coming down, competition is going up, everybody is slashing prices, and I think you know, those in Australia can correct me if I'm wrong. So what they did was, they went to the grocery stores and said, who can give me a lease rental for the space to run the shop? And surprise, surprise, 7-Eleven could give them more rental than they could collect from their whole business. So immediately, they were already better off just to rethink about the strategic positioning of what they were. And then secondly, and this was completely unexpected by them, after they let out the space to 7-Eleven, people saw, oh, it's 7-Eleven. I'm going there to pick up some groceries. Ah, they've got petrol as well, or gasoline. I'll pump that as well. So the, the gasoline sales at Shell doubled. Nobody expected it. But it's about thinking, taking a step back and thinking, what exactly are you offering? Who exactly have you the, the, uh, called out to, you know? The, the price service uh, offerings that you're talking about, and in fact, I think Mike Levine yesterday mentioned instead of price service, he used convenience. Uh, and I agree, price convenience type of thing. We're looking at it, and you know, if people would say, of course airlines offer it. Look, you can have this service at this price, or you can have this service at this price. Again, the concept is right, but we've got a long way to go. If I'm in a department store looking for a shirt and I want a discounted price shirt, I can go to a discounted, but I can say, no, I don't like blue color, I'll, I'll take that yellow one or I'll take that white one in that discounted. Yep. If I go to an airline and say, you want this, well, then this is it. It's going to be next Tuesday at 3 o'clock. Yep. You, you know, you, you can't go on the 10 o'clock flight. Yes, they do have a lower price, and yes, there's a service option, but I'm restricted to what you can do, whereas over here, you know, if I want a 30% discount price shoot, I want a blue one, we'll find there's a, there's a blue one in that size. You know? So that's one area that we need to go a lot further. 
but coming back, and I'll come back to the coming back to a point that you made, uh, Christoph. I'm going to pick up on that one about the information that's got to go back to the customer. Typically, the PNR that you're working with works something like this. You're on a small flight to connect to go to a long haul. The earlier flight is delayed by two hours for whatever reason, mechanical, weather, whatever. You're going to miss the connection, right? And airlines have beautifully now are sending me messages that you're going to miss your connection. Don't worry about it, Mr. Taneja. You're now booked on tomorrow's flight because there's only one long haul flight, right? They've done their job, which is we are customer centric. We sent you information within 30 seconds to say that you're going to miss your flight and you're booked on tomorrow's flight. Who in the heavens said, I want to go on tomorrow's flight? I'm going to a board meeting. Tomorrow's flight is totally useless. Who decided tomorrow's flight is what I want? Instead, it should come a little message. You're going to miss your flight. Here are six options and here are the prices that go with that. And the last option, you can still make it, it's on a competitor, it's gonna cost you $500 more. And let me choose, yep, I'll take that option. Or no, 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 tomorrow's flight is fine. You see what I'm getting at? The information that is on that PNR does not have more on what is it that I really want. At that situation, in that situation. So in those two, would you like to comment on either in the case of what are we doing in terms of providing real customer-centric time, real-time information, and two, about these price, service, or as Mike said, price convenience uh, options that are available. Any comments on I know in the normal airline business, um, some people look on charter carriers with slight arrogance, but I have to say, having worked in that industry, there are far more advanced than we think uh, here in this room, uh, because they sell integrated travel solutions. And um, without disclosing the name, uh, I had the responsibility for, for one carrier which had onboard sales per person, per neck, of 54 euros. 54 euros. That is 80% of what I get currently on my, on my short haul business as an average yield. And they have already entered the next S-curve. They have jumped off the old one and entered the new the one because the entire uh, uh, shopping basket contains a hotel, a rental car, an excursion, um, uh, duty-free sales on board, and a little tiny bit, which is a flight. And also the customer's attention is drawn to the whole travel experience and the whole price. So the travel price is just one variable. And I believe if you factor in the price convenience equation here and your board meeting next morning, of course, is the triggering factor. That is basically what a new CNR, the new customer name record, uh, uh, permanently stored should, should provide the airline and the customer in order to get the best deal. Mm -hmm. So I believe uh, we, we really are in a flattening out S-curve of the old business model and we can only uh, achieve the next step jointly with the airports, with the IT providers and the retailers. And yesterday someone mentioned Apple, you mentioned it a lot, or Google, or, or so on and so forth. Uh, my 70-year-old daughter is my best technology advisor because she's much faster on her iPhone finding me a convenient flight connection than I can do with my, with my old-fashioned CRS uh, thinking and, 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 and going to the convenient travel sites. Definitely. In terms of price service options, price convenience options, do you think that there is more room for improvements in that area that you talked about? Yeah, I think, I think um, you know, I, I know this is really unpopular, speaking at an online conference saying such things, but um, for example, when somebody misses a flight or a flight is delayed, you know, my friends will call me because they say, you work at the airport, Tell me how do I get from point A to point B most quickly at the best price. Because I'm not going to look through five different websites and then when I go back to the one website where I think it's the cheapest price, when I redo the reservation booking, the price goes up. Or the website hangs. You know? So 
I know this is really unpopular to a lot of people here, but I think what we do have to consider is that it's a bigger market space. There are other product service providers who need to work more closely with you and you need to accept them as being your business partners in totality. Um, and I think for me, the airport is an integrated business partner. We see your customers as you see them, but they tell different parts of the story to us and they tell some, maybe some other different parts of the story of their needs and wants to you as an airline. And they tell different parts of that story to different other providers. The land transport providers that bring them to the airport, the retailers, shops basically, who take care of them whilst they're waiting for their flights during the dwell time that they're in the airport. So, I personally feel we can all do a little bit better to come together a little bit more and share that information and find solutions to make it a habit for people to spend more money when they want to travel and they're happy doing it. So it becomes a pattern of behavior, a preference rather than a need. Elia, yeah, I think, oh, I I'm sorry, go ahead. A little, more, a little bit more is not enough. <laughs> we celebrated the, the paperless uh, travel or the ticketless travel a couple of years ago with a big bang bang in Yata. And if I go through Heathrow Airport and I want to go through security, I go to uh, H.W. Smith, want to buy a newspaper, go to the next stop, want to buy something else. Every time someone asks me my boarding pass, where are you going to? And then someone types that thing in. It's ridiculous. It is ridiculous, you know. On one end, we save a piece of paper and be extremely proud. And on the other side, we collect data like 50 years ago. Um, stunning. And to add to your example, I mean, do you only want the travel options for the next day for no, your board no. meeting? You want the offer of a hotel All in options. case you can absolutely wait to the next All day. options. So, yes. yeah, I'll talk a little bit more on that later, but I want to give opportunity to other people. We're talking about information here. We're talking about whether it's information within an airline or within an airport or across them. Given your expertise in, in uh, information uh, from CETA, how do you think, what is the direction of technology that can help us not only to improve within each sector, airlines and airports and so on, but across? Uh, technology is a name. It's, it's not, it, it, I guess the issue is you go to an airline airport conference and if you ask the question, whose passenger is it? You know, both the airport and the airline will put up their hand and say, that's my passenger. You know, they made the choice to fly with me. They didn't make a choice to connect through Kuala Lumpur because, you know, they want to fly on, I don't know, on an airline X. Um, and when you've got two parties sort of fighting like that, when they should be cooperating on the passenger. And I understand that between airlines, you would not want to give up the passenger data. Apple will never give you their consumer data. Google will never give you that data because this is something that they hold key to, them, to, to, to their model. The airlines and the CNR, you'll never get the airlines to cooperate to sort of give up. But between airlines and airports, what, I, what is hard to understand is why is there, isn't there more cooperation? And you can. I mean, Qt designed uh, 25 years ago, holds no passenger data. Why? Because the way it was designed, uh, the airlines demanded that the passenger data stays on the DCS. Uh, so cute. Again, enabler for the airlines to use the DCS. So at the end of the day, technology can do whatever you want it to do. And, and I think that's been proven. Um, CNN this morning was uh, one of the sort of sound bites was, you know, 10 years ago, we didn't think that all of our lives are going to be on, on an iPhone or on a phone. You know, 10 years from now, are we going to be using a phone? You know, technology moves, it moves fast. There's a lot of information, but you know, what about people in the room? How do the people want to cooperate? What do they want to get out of this? That, that's probably the main question. Yeah. Tara, from your, your experience uh, on, the, on the smaller uh, sector side, what do you feel about some of the issues? Do they only apply to the bigger ones or do they apply to your size as well? Well, of course, uh, the size matters. Yeah. And the, uh, 
but the, the certain fundamentals are, uh, are applied with the big and small. And the, we do all, all collect a lot of data. Uh, of course, it is a challenge how do you leverage the data? Mm -hmm. Because uh, the leveraging the data can be very costly, and then again, what are the returns on investment on that one? But the, uh, talking about what are the data you could share with, the, uh, with your value chain in order to make it seamless for the customer. I think uh, the technology is already there that we can actually uh, have a certain levels of information. So the, as an airline, I would feel comfortable sharing uh, the flight number details and the passenger name details and even the frequent flyer status on uh, uh, when they go to the uh, WAs or something else on, uh, at the airport. And this near field communication on a mobile enables that. But obviously I don't want to tell them how much they paid for the ticket and uh, how many times they traveled with me in, uh, in the past. So the, uh, or the how to get in touch with them uh, and uh, do direct marketing. But some of the passengers that, uh, that you're carrying, obviously they're not just O&D passengers in smaller regional markets, they could very easily be connecting to go on to lower halls, right? Yeah. yeah in, in, in that case, you have very much of a concern getting the information you know, integrated across because these passengers are going to go on. Right? So just because you're small and, and carrying maybe mostly regional passengers does not mean that you are not now involved in the bigger picture of providing this seamless product that we keep talking about. Of course not. So we, uh, we do have uh, our customers travel around the world like uh, any other customer. Uh, although we don't reach all the points, but the, uh, uh, that's the that comes to my first point is that in order to create this Apple environment, you have to be an alliance. Mm -hmm. So the, that's the only way because the one single airline cannot cover the whole world, but you still want to treat the customer equally wherever they are in the world, and uh, that comes through the uh, through the alliances. Other alternative is that the and I remember we had this discussion for five years ago that the world is. Uh, probably going in the direction that the, uh, the big uh, online travel agencies rule the world and they just buy capacity from the airlines. So the airlines are just the capacity providers or, or resource companies mm -hmm. for those. So mm -hmm. why not Expedia becoming the, uh, uh, the apple of the aviation industry and then uh, if the customer wants to have a, a cheap journey by a hub, they offer a certain thing, and if they want to do a uh, quick service with the good quality product, then they offer a second thing. Because like you also said, we all have different needs at any given time. Even if we would go for the business, mm -hmm. we want to work. When we go to the meeting, we want to prepare. When we come back from the meeting, we probably want to uh, have a glass of wine to celebrate, or to basically uh, uh, bite the bullet if the meeting went bad. But the, the the basically, the different uh, needs are different every time. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Welcome. I wasn't uh, quite sure uh, how much of the questions you had heard. So, would, have you been here before, or did no, you? No, I wasn't here before. No. Oh, okay. So, you want to participate in some of the questions that are coming up, or do you want to? I'll participate in the future questions. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, Chris, did you want to add anything before I show some questions that I put up on the uh, slides? Okay, I have uh, some questions here, uh, not necessarily in order uh, of importance, but I thought I'll throw some out to, to get some views uh, from our panelists. Uh, can you read them from here? I, mean, I have trouble reading them. My, my first question is that this comment that comes up, you know, almost every day, seamless product. Well, I would like to have somebody first define for me, what does the word seamless product mean? Are we all clear on what this seamless is? Is it just some words that have been used or phrase that has been used among the alliance partners? Or does the word seamless mean seamless from, you know, between an airline and an airport from the time I check in? What is this seamless? I think we need to define that. So that's the first thing. And then the second part of it is that uh, it's one thing that alliances claim that they are there because they are providing seamless product. Well, I'm a customer, and from a customer, and I travel a lot, and from a customer's point of view, I don't see that, okay? Or if they say that they have it, but I don't see it. So, but then we gotta go one step further. 
even if they did issue me a boarding pass where well, the first airline did it and said, okay, fine, you got it all the way up there. Then there's the issue of the, uh, the airports. You know, where, where do we go with that? And then last one, and we're still on the first one, if that seamless product doesn't exist, or not to the degree I would like it to exist, among club alliance partners, and then with the airports and airlines and security and so on, how can technology help in terms of making that product more seamless if there is such a thing? Would the panel like to take think, a shot at that? I think on, on a seamless product, it's really living up to the customer's expectations from the time that he gets into the parking lot or just before getting into the parking lot to the time he leaves the airport on the other end. It's how much time will it take you to park? How much time will, you get, will it take to you, for you to go from the parking lot to security to, uh, to the gate? You know, is the flight going to be on time? Um, is the connection going to work? Etc. Et that, to me, that's a seamless product. And um, I in its think totality, that in its, its totality, totality. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. not just across an alliance partners, in its totality. Exactly. And, and to me, you know, most of the time, by the when you get in your seat on pretty much any carrier, you know what to expect. You know what you're going to get. But from the time you get to the parking lot to the time you get to the gate, that's the, the great um, unknown for a lot of passengers, and that that's part of the seamless experience and that's really working between the airports um, and the airlines to share that data. Because if the airports know that, if the airports can tell the customer right from the start how long the security queues are, how long the immigration queues are, how much time will it take for him to walk and not run to the gate, you know, that, that's the information that, that is really required. On the seamless product and alliances, um, yeah, um, obviously I work for a systems provider. I, I know what goes on on the links. I travel once a week. Once a month, a, an alliance partner cannot issue an onward boarding pass for me. Um, at times, I'm clueless as to why not, but obviously uh, things happen. But yeah, it's not a seamless product. And for you to get to, uh, let's say, Charles de Gaulle to, to pick an airport in Europe, um, where the rules for Air France are, you need to get your boarding pass 45 minutes before the flight, and you're there 43, and you just missed your flight, an onward flight, even though you arrived at the airport on time, you know you're not gonna be shopping on board, you know you're not gonna be shopping uh, in the airport either, and you know you're not going through CDG next time you fly either. So, you know, this is really sort of living within the seamless expectations, let's say. Christopher? <laughs> Fifteen years ago, the Star Alliance was founded, and uh, still I'm proud that I was part of it. But we had to come up with a huge brainwash to explain what seamless travel is, because a coach here was not intuitive. Um, because you bought a Lufthansa ticket, and there was a Varic plane standing outside. So it took a couple of years to, to really sell the idea of seamless travel via coach here, and so on and so forth. Um, um, in addition, we promised the customer that one lounge at every airport would facilitate to accommodate you with your, with your Star Alliance uh, uh, membership card and so on and so forth. Fifteen years later, um, code share is absolutely redundant uh, because technology uh, and through check-in issuing tickets from Aer Lingus to Virgin Atlantic and so on is absolutely no problem. It's absolutely common sense. Uh, uh, the younger generation will not remember the code share as the only way of, of seamless travel. Um, the second thing is in Brussels Airport, um, still there is an SIS lounge, there's a Brussels Airline lounge, and you have to negotiate and so for people to explain why you cannot access the SIS lounge with a, as a Brussels free flyer card and so on and so forth. I believe it's a big smokescreen and uh, the, the, uh, the feature at the time, 15 years ago, have become absolutely redundant and one should clearly say that the added value of seamless travel sold by the alliances at the time is over. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I think, uh, well, for me, I think the seamless travel is uh, uh, convenience, simplicity and uh, consistency. So the, uh, if we, uh, Christoph mentioned these uh, uh, lounge access issues with the current alliance members do suffer. 
uh, then th there are other things. So there are airports where I have to print the mobile bo uh, boarding pass. So I have to have a physical paper. Then on the next airport, it, it, it's okay that it's an SMS form. And on the third for, uh, airport, it has to be a mobile, but it's a barcode. So the, as a customer, how do you how do you difference it? How do you how do I know what do I need to do next? So the uh, that's uh, that's something what the airlines would say. Yes, we have a seamless service. You can do uh, check in for every airline. You can do it online and so forth. But at the same time, for the customer, it's not consistent. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess the question for me is why do we <coughs> check in all together? Why do we follow that process? Fine, dropping bags is one thing. But is that process redundant? Why was it put into place in, in the first place? I guess it must have been in the 70s when, uh, when aviation really went mass market. But, you know, shouldn't you just get your 2D barcode on your ticket? Shouldn't you have your seat allocated? I mean, most airlines kind of, you, you plan your capacity six months in advance at least. You know what, what plane you're gonna have at what time in what airport. Why not just do it during the whole ticketing process? Why bother going and issuing that paper? I was I was in that celebration that uh, Bizignani had with you know with uh, the last uh, last tickets being uh, shredded. Why not do the same thing with the boarding pass? I understand mobile boarding pass, but why do we need a board, boarding pass altogether? At all. Anyone else want to add any? No. Um, yeah. I, I think from an airport perspective, I think uh, we would have to agree. I think uh, we don't, all of us, we don't ask enough questions, why do we need to do this? And I think I would definitely agree, I mean, on, from an IT solutions provider perspective as well, if they are willing to bring that discussion to us, uh, we are more than willing to advance that as vigorously as we can. Um, and I think to, 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 go, to go one step back even, I, I think um, a lot of what I'm hearing today, I feel is about product differentiation when we talk about seamless travel. And I think there's not sufficient focus on consumer segmentation. Because right now, you're thinking from an airline perspective, you think, what will work for me? Because I'm thinking my passenger wants this, wants that. But in reality, there are all different types of consumers out there. So that's consumer segmentation. They will ultimately drive what they will adapt, adopt. Just like the iPhone versus the iPad versus the iPod versus everything. So you can try to deliver the products that fit what you think they want. But let's not forget, there are many, many different types of they, the, the passengers. You know, you, you need to kind of, as you said, you know, what's business intelligence? It's not quite consumer intelligence. You, 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 you need to really get into it that there are different things. In terms of the um, regional express experience, some of the points that have been made with respect to the needs and expectations of consumers, how do you see that? Because you've got a very different business model in terms of uh, the not only the network that you're flying, but the type of airplanes. Uh, uh, I believe we were talking about uh, SAW 340s. Uh, in markets where they're very different, how do you see, is that a very, seg very specific segment of the marketplace, or some of the general comments that we're talking about apply just as well to your, your customers? I think the whole discussion on seamless travel is a discussion for the airports. From the airline perspective, it's nice to be able to have our passengers having as little hassle as possible, but it is really not our problem. And this has to be something that has to be taken up with each airport because each of them have their specific uh, constraints. So from the airline perspective, what really matters is does this give us a competitive advantage? So if the airport is what it is, it's a level playing field for all the airlines, and therefore it really doesn't worry the, the airline. It's nice to have it, it's good to improve efficiency, but it doesn't sell more tickets for a particular airline. Mm -hmm. So we, we do not really get too preoccupied about the issue of seamless travel. Um, 
we don't do very much interline. We have some agreements with um, Virgin for the baggage aspect of it. So I think that that's good. But um, again, I think for the simplest um, product, we, we don't really care about it. We care about being able to sell the airline services and products in a seamless manner. Mm -hmm. But that's a different discussion from the seamless travel aspect of it. Thank you. Well, uh, I don't want to monopolize the, the time of the panel on all the questions I have, which I will bring up later. But at this stage, let me stop for a minute and, and, and go to the audience. With these lights, I'm having trouble seeing. But yes, there's a question right there. Frank Levine, I think this is a fascinating discussion, but I think it doesn't quite go far enough. Our airport friend says he doesn't want people to sit down comfortably because he wants them to shop. But if the customer goes to shop, and it's a sophisticated customer, he sees that some things are he needs right now. A drink, uh, perhaps some food, uh, certainly something to read something like that. If he is charged a little more than he would be charged somewhere else, he says, okay, not so bad, I can live with this. Then he walks next door into a shop that's selling uh, gadgets or clothing or whatever. And he whips out his smartphone, as he does now at Best Buy, and he sees that he's being charged 30% more than he would be charged if he was buying this outside the airport. Do you think he's grateful for the convenience of the shopping experience? No, he can't sit down because our friend won't let him. And he has to stand there and look at things in a resentful frame of mind because he knows he is being overcharged. So if we are going to reorganize the business in the way that has been suggested, it's a very interesting discussion. I think Christoph's comments are, are particularly interesting in, in, in that respect you really have to accept what goes up on those slides and say you have a smart consumer. This consumer in the airport or on the plane, if you're talking about duty-free or whatever else, is going to have gotten in the habit, especially if it's Christo's 17-year-old daughter, of getting a lot of information and knowing whether he or she is being overcharged or not overcharged and whether they accept that, quote, overcharge for the convenience or resent it for the captivity. So if we are going to go in the direction you are talking about now, we need to be as sophisticated as retailers as we think we are, maybe we are and maybe we aren't, as airlines. Thank you. Okay, can I, can I yes, ask? please. I, I think um, personally and for Malaysia Airports, I would completely agree with the comments and questions or, or the, the, the very pointed comments that uh, Mike has brought up because the key is how can you treat your customer in that fashion? If your customer wants to come in and sit down, why can't he choose to do so? Why? Right? And I think that's why for me at Malaysia Airports, um, okay, the, the long story is this, right? Um, the person who was supposed to be here in all of your booklets, he's got about 40 years of experience in aviation. I think a lot of you know him very fondly, um, and a lot of you understand what he, where he comes from when he says something uh, that's uh, Tansiri Bashar Ahmad. Um, instead of him speaking today, he sent somebody who's not even 40 years old. Right? And everybody goes, what are you doing? So he didn't say anything. But I'll tell you a little bit about how I think the airports should move forward. First of all, I've had quite a lot of experience looking after consumer type of companies. The supermarkets, the manufacturers like Nestle, the F&B service providers like uh, the equivalent of McDonald's and KFC. And I've also had the opportunity to look after a lot of Telecom service providers, ICT service providers, and I think the key is this. If we do not fully understand their business models, if we do not fully understand 
how they work, then that is where we are today. We end up commoditizing our service and we end up the customer thinking it's a lousy place to shop because the prices are twice as high, there's no place for me to sit down and relax and my flight is not on time. So we've all been the victims of all these other companies who understand their business model but who don't tell us the whole truth. So I would, I would uh, reassure you that where we are in Malaysia airports and all the other in overseas airports we're at, I personally and Malaysia airports, we are trying to change the things completely for the benefit of the passengers such that, as you said, the pie gets bigger. Once the pie gets bigger, then it's up to you, your efficiency, how you drive that efficiency to get a larger slice of that pie. But first of all, the pie has to get bigger. If we all work on trying to segment and trying to outdo each other, the pie may even shrink in some circumstances. But so not only, not only, excuse me a second, not only does the pie need to get bigger, but we need to have some consistency or some coordination between the objectives. As I see it, the objective of, of an airport, not your an airport, may very well be to, ma to maximize the revenue from concessionaries, right? Whereas for an airline point of view, is to process that customer the fastest way possible. From transportation security, it may very well be that we've got to make sure that, you know, nothing bad goes through. So I'm looking at these objectives are not necessarily consistent. That doesn't mean they're wrong, but they're not coordinated. They're not consistent. So until we get the... It would be no different than where I spend most of my time in an airline, that the marketing goes one way, operations goes another way, finance goes the third way. There has to be one vision. I completely agree with you. And coming back to the shops, right? And that's precisely the trap that all of us fall into. Because the shops say, look, I've got to maximize my revenue and this is how I'm going to do it. I'm going to double my prices and you're going to get good rental at the airports, yeah. right? But if you understand the retail business model, you will understand that they don't have to double their prices. They don't have to. Because the consumer is going to be there waiting for an average of an hour per flight. They're going to be there. They will shop. The mechanics are completely different from a downtown mall. You know? Christopher. You talked about the courage Shell had approaching 7-Eleven and I believe we have to have the courage to talk to each other and we want to take it one step further because the luxury we have to have our passengers strapped in their seats for hours is exactly what the Herods of this world want to do. Why don't we let the people shop on board? We don't carry all that stuff in the trolleys burning fuel like hell but have it upon arrival collected when you anyhow have to wait the 15 minutes for your baggage and, and I think it's a win-win situation for each uh, and, and everyone. Um, because since Amazon has been um, uh, becoming the mainstream, people are used to that and they have the time and they have the, the, the leisure uh, to, to really select and it's a very convenient service uh, to pick up the goods you bought. You don't have to wait for, for them to be mailed to you. Um, so I can only see a win-win situation. Uh, the profit share, that certainly needs to be discussed. But uh, there are so many models of GSAs uh, I think we are most familiar with. Uh, there must be a solution to that problem. I completely agree. I completely agree with Christoph because at the moment that is where we're pushing the envelope. Every aspect, every airline that wants to talk to us, we push the envelope. You may or may not be aware that one third of our profit before tax actually goes to the airlines already. And we're still pushing the envelope. Before I take uh, another question, uh, is there any other can I, can points I, to make to Mike's question? Yeah. Can I give a perspective, a different perspective? Please, I'll come back to you, everybody. I'm a bit surprised with uh, Mike's question because it seems to want to go against uh, free market forces. And uh, I, I would have thought that the Americans would be a big proponent of uh, free market forces. Um, a shop in an airport charges what it thinks it needs to charge to make the maximum profit. And um, with no disrespect to a colleague from the Malaysian airport, the shops probably know better than the airport 
how you should be pricing his products. And if he does it wrong, it will be out of business. If he does it well, you'll have another shop in the airport. So I cannot understand the rationale of why someone will be saying you shouldn't be charging them more. I mean, business-wise, it makes no sense. As an airline, if I can charge somebody more, I will charge him more. Um, for example, we will charge our customers, and I was discussing this yesterday, $2.40 for an SMS to give you your itinerary before you fly. Singapore Airlines gives it free of charge to all passengers. I charge $2.40 and I have something like 17% take-up rate of all my travellers. So, if I can get away with it, why shouldn't I? Even if it costs me one cent for the SMIs, why shouldn't I do that? And before Mike, you grab the mic. A second perspective. I, I would be very happy when the airport makes money from the passengers through retail. And that's the discussion I have with um, Sydney Airport, one of the nastiest airports in the world. And every time they want to raise my, my renter, and they say, look, the shops are paying so much, I, I need to charge you so much. I say to them, you are deriving a lot of profits from retail. Where do the passengers come from? I bring you the passengers that patronize the shops, that bring you the profits, so I deserve a share of this. And the more money you make from this, the less you should be charging me, not the other way around, pricing my, you know, whatever rent I, I have, my lounge, on the basis of what the shops need to, uh, are willing to pay because they get good profits from it. So my perspective of this is I'm very happy if they make more money, provided they use this to reduce the overall charges to the airlines, which, which is logical because we bring them the passengers in the first place. They do not go to the airport for the sake of shopping. They are only shopping because we bring them there. So my perspective is I'm very happy if they can charge a lot and make a lot of money, provided some of this gets back to the airline. Any other uh, comments on Mike's question before I go to can another you, one? Yeah. Can, I just, can I just add on to uh, confirm uh, what Tim Hai just said, that um, at Malaysia airports, the charges for the air, airlines are lower than all the other comparable city capital airports in the region. And that's precisely how we do it. So not only do we share that amount of our profit before tax, in terms, through incentives to airlines, we also use that to ensure that the charges remain the lowest in the region. And that's the only way to do it moving forward, I believe. Anyone else? Okay. Emery. I think Mike is very eager okay. to stop. Um, <laughs> thank you. I, I, I just want to comment on uh, two points. One is your S curve, what is the next? And then uh, second is uh, Christos, excellent example around retail and uh, you know, the gas stations. So, and also talk about the Facebook IPO. We know that there is this 100 billion IPO that's going to happen in, in, in a month's time. So think about what Facebook are doing. You have 800 million, they sit in front of Facebook, they, they talk to each other, they spend time in front of computer software and airlines you have domain you have the domain you have um, you know some airlines um, 10 million 40 million we heard about TK 40 many airlines Ryanair EasyJet 50 60 million so this is the customer base and um, a passenger in an aircraft is spending what two hours five hours ten hours so you have them for ten hours like Facebook, people are sitting in front of Facebook and how Facebook is making money. Start advertising, start selling products to these people. So what's preventing airlines to engage with IT companies and develop um, software, develop programs that markets goods and services to the passengers on their aircraft and then get a share of the revenue. And then as Christoph said earlier, then the the stuff that they buy, they can be delivered to them. It doesn't have to be sold during the aircraft. And that can create a major revenue source for the airlines. Any of you want to take this before I do? Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, yeah. Maybe I'll just add on something. I think 
to me, my view is the S curve comes when somebody decides that they want to make the S, that they want to make the S, next S curve, S curve. So whether it's the Apple or the BlackBerry or Nokia previously, they decided they're going to do the next S curve. It's not going to come tomorrow, the day after, after New Year's Eve or wherever, whenever. Somebody has to take that initiative. That's my view. Across all industries, we've seen that, and I think it's exactly the same here. Is anybody brave enough to grab yeah. the, 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 those reins and move forward? Now, secondly, I think to the point about why aren't airlines or any other product or service uh, provider working with IT companies more closely? And you know, I, I tell this story internally as well when I joined Malaysia Airports, and I said. I told the IT department, the bad news is, I'm not an IT guy. Okay? And the worst news is, the only IT guys I think are worth their salt are either A, people like Ilya, who are heading big, big companies, looking after very lot of important things, or B, millionaires. So the mindset is completely different. We're about to... Uh move in an area, you're quite right, the social technology in general and, and the, uh, the Facebook people that you're talking about in particular, uh, they're going to take us on a curve way up at the top because you, you know, we have so many hours in the aeroplane. Think about the money that is made by airport in their concessionary revenues from the little bit of the time that the passenger does spend at the airport. So from that little bit of the time, uh, I remember the days I used to work for the airports, you know, as much as 50, 60, 70, 80% of the revenue, of the profit came from the concessionary side, not landing airplanes and all of that, not the air side, it's the concessionary side. Well, if they can make that kind of stuff in a few hours, where are we when we have now flights that are approaching 18 hours, right? Well, there could also be a coordination with the airport too. I think it was some, maybe you, Christopher, you were giving the example last night when we were talking that why couldn't I just order the flowers or something and then as soon as I land, I don't want to be carrying these flowers from my wife right all the way in the airplane and everything. You know, why can't I just do all of that and as soon as I arrive at the airport, somebody hands me this and I take it home. So not only the curve is going to move up in terms of what we are allowed to do as each sector, airlines, airport. But the coordination between them to facilitate, raise the experience of the customer. I may not even have thought about doing that, but if I knew in the aeroplane that yes, I can order these flowers and I've been away for three days, or I will buy them. So I think that we're just at the beginning of the S curve in terms of the role social technology is going to play, enabled by the mobility and interaction with other members in the value chain. Anybody else? Yes. Well, there are already airlines who sell flowers and more. So mm -hmm. That's already uh, that's already done. But the I think the next evolution will come, which needs to have technology, which is Wi-Fi on board or connectivity on board. Uh, the ground is that you have your iPads and you make your selections of the airport you land, and then the stuff will be delivered. Mm -hmm. So the, there are already platforms in place, and I think Norwegian, for example, is already testing that with their free, free Wi-Fi. So things are moving into that direction. But is that, that yes, it is an evolution. It's part of the S curve. But is that the revolution which will change the industry? I don't know. Yeah. I guess what, what we've done with Malaysia is we allow we allow we uh, create a check-in through Facebook. That way you can see if your friends are checking in for the same flight, that way you can, you, can, you can choose a seat that is right next to them or on the other side of the plane if you don't want to see them again. So it's a, you know, it is going to take you on a different S-curve. How you use it is, is really up to, uh, up to us, it's, 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 but it, it, it is done and it will be done a lot more. There are a number of questions out here. Uh, Peter, were you first or Jeff? Jeff, go ahead. And then Peter, and I think, Mike, did you have a question too? Okay, all right. Just a detailed uh, question, maybe following up on uh, the 
free Wi-Fi point in, in Finland, uh, if I understood it correctly. Is anyone aware of free Wi-Fi that's being made available that's branded? In my, my experience of free Wi-Fi or even pay for Wi-Fi is that it's a third party provider, has nothing to do with the brand of the carrier that I'm on or the airport that I'm in. Is there an opportunity there to create an opening screen that provides opportunities for in-flight signals, even though the stuff is on the board, it's in the airport? Um, onward flights, other travel experiences that might be of interest. In other words, you've got the passenger. Uh, the passenger wants to be online. It's, it seems to me that it's a wasted opportunity to just provide go-go an opportunity to talk to the passenger and not talk to the passenger yourself through that facility. Go ahead. The, the, short, the short answer to that, uh, Jeff, from our experience is yes, it's possible. And yes, it's coming to an airport in Malaysia, airports near you soon. And the, the beauty is this. I, I think it's fair for me to share with all of you is that every airport in the world should be able to do it for you. Because again, look, it's not rocket science. The people who do these things are telling me and telling us that they can. So why hasn't it happened before? I don't know. But it's going to happen. Jeff, I think the, the, the general airline attitude would be, let's do it ourselves. Let's try to integrate the whole thing, you know, huge projects, 150 consultants, and here we go, right? I, I would absolutely agree with what you say. But, you know, let other people do that. There are specialists, and we are not the most sophisticated industry in the world. We are not. And uh, I believe many other people are so far down the road in integrating that and I mentioned Amazon, you mentioned Apple and so on and so forth, uh, let's not throw too many names um, but I'm, I'm certain the technical solution is available and I believe it's not the airline or the airport who yeah. should do that integration job. I fully agree with your opening statement, it, it is really the gas station <laughs> just, just, just watch Google just yeah. watch Google, anyone else uh, I Comments guess, on uh, Jeff's question? Yeah, I guess my my uh, my question is to the airports that actually charge for Wi-Fi. Why do they do that? They've got they can get so much information on the passenger. Um, how often he's in the airport? What does he do? How long does he stay on Wi-Fi? By giving it free of charge. But there are airports out there that still want to get the five bucks, so that at the end of the you know at the end of the year they may get a couple of hundred thousand dollars for it. On, on the Wi-Fi on board, I think different airlines approach it differently. Uh, we, we've we got a company called On Air. Uh, we own a, a part of a company called On Air. And when when I kind of see the On Air on board, it's normally a small logo. It is part of the service the airlines kind of brand it as their own. For example, Etihad takes a lot of pride in the fact that they do have Wi-Fi on board and they, they really try to, to push it and advertise it as well. So I, again, it's a, for the airlines, for this short period of time, getting Wi-Fi on board is a differentiator. And I, I think if I was an airline, I would probably want it to sort of really sort of blast it in people's faces that we've got this service. And I would not charge for it uh, in the first, in the, in the ideal world, and you have the experience here in this hotel, it I think is perfect, no matter whether you walk, iPad, iPod, mobile phone, you are online without asking for codes. This is inconvenient. We don't want to prevent the customer from buying things. Why make it difficult for them? Make it easy. Mm -hmm. and, and we charge back in the, in the whole bottom line. Uh, that, that, that is not really the obstacle. It cannot, it should not. Okay, let me move to uh, Peter's question. Um, still very much on the same tack, actually. I was, I was going to, even before Tara, Tara made the point about the, the in-flight connectivity, that was really half of where I wanted to go. Um, one of the things that's bugged me for years has been the inability of airlines and airports to milk the passenger much more effectively because he is, he's a purchaser, she's a purchaser. Um, and once we have the secret ingredient of interactivity, plus presumably credit card security in flight, um, I don't think, at that stage, we actually have a choice about moving in the S-curve. I think the airports have been incredibly slow and greedy in trying to keep, to lock out the airlines in this whole process. The airlines have been um, 
not dumb, but largely not enabled by not having Wi-Fi in flight. But if you do have a passenger for eight hours, and you've got interactivity, and you've got credit card security, so the next step is you don't have a choice as an airport in that S-curve because you've got Googles and Facebooks and everybody else. And on one or two occasions where there has been the ingenuity to, to use these external services, the airports have stepped in to prevent other parties from delivering goods on arrival. Now that to me seems the ultimate in, in stupidity because the airport certainly is protecting its own interests, but it's not taking advantage of them. And, and I think, as I say, you're not going to have a choice with the S-curve as an airport. Someone is going to come in from outside and either through competition authorities or whatever, oblige the airport to make space available so I can pick up the goods that I buy in flight when I arrive, whether it's a lawnmower or a, uh, a, a pack of roses or, or a car, uh, because I'm getting a cheap deal, maybe in a, on a sort of Groupon basis. You know, let's, let's have a Groupon service on, on, online on the aircraft. Everybody on this aircraft, if you get 50 people who will buy a car, will have one delivered to you. 20% discount in the airport park. You know. Someone's going to do it, but the airports are not cooperating. They don't want to cooperate with the airlines because they see their revenues being lost. They don't see the pie getting bigger. They see it being taken away from us. The, the, ex the external people, as I, I'll be back in a minute, the external people that I see hovering around how to take that S-curve and move it up law, not just the Apples, but in fact the Googles. And, and, and the key point that I'm going to make a little bit in the second session starting is that a company like Google, they're not entering the distribution part of it in the traditional sense of, well, let's just connect, you know, another mouth to feed. So that's another 3%, 5%, whatever it is that we used to, you know, pay to the GDSs. Now we've got to pay to this company. They're looking at moving on the part of the S-curve that is very different. They're going to make gobs of money, but it is not going to be to collect a little bit more from an airline for the use of making the reservation, providing the information. So that part of it, making the airport, is going to be right there. Let me take some. You had a, yes. Yeah. I, I think that um, what Christoph said was really makes um, a lot of sense. Why should you be having this trolley and pushing things and you know the logistics of stocking up the aircraft? But I, I think that the airlines are not um, brave and bold and imaginative enough because we are only looking at maybe 20% of the possibility. I, and as an airline, you could actually almost achieve the full objective yourself without even going to the airports. For example, if, if I were running an airline that has somebody captive for 10 hours, I could very easily work with each of the destination airports and get every store to put all their products into an onboard system whereby the customer can actually shop from the destination stores on board and pay for it on board. You, you can do that. You, you don't have to wait for the airline, uh, airport, you don't have to wait for nobody. You can do it yourself. And for the customer, instead of having a limited catalogue, he has a catalogue of all the products in all the stores in the airport, and you can do it yourself. I'm not saying that First, that's the final solution. I'm saying that the entire added value chain will change. How the work share will play out, I don't know. And I think the regulators already waiting behind the bushes to ask us whether the VAT is due when you, when you purchase in the middle of the Atlantic or not, um, and all these type of things. So we do not have the final solution. But what I'm saying is that we make the customer jump over fences from the parking lot to the airport to the lounge to the thing. That, I believe, is the old word because it's customer inconvenience to show your boarding pass eight times while walking through the airport and, and, and all these restrictions. I believe we have to enter that new world and it will all start and shall approach in 7 11. And, and coming back to uh, Peter's problem with the, the airport, I cannot imagine why the airline wouldn't finalize a transaction on board, 
have all the payment done, and then your own staff on the ground would place the order with the shops, get the shops delivered, all the products are ready, go to the belt, when they pick up their baggage, they'll pick up the products. You almost do not need the airport to be involved. And you can do this yourself with, with the shops in the airport, get the system done. And can you imagine, instead of a catalogue of 100 products, you have a catalogue of thousands of products. Mm. And that is what is going to use up the 10 hours for them to shop everywhere in the, in the airport. If, yeah. um, sorry. That was exactly my point. But when airlines, when the odd occasion when airlines are trying to do it, the airport has prevented that delivery process from occurring. And that's where I think yeah. someone is going to make a breakthrough. And it's going to be someone big like a Facebook or a Google, and they're going to blow it one part. Although, of course, as Christoph says, you've got all those taxes really waiting <laughs> to come and grab bits here and make it all complicated. And I'm sure the airports will be. It's with them too. <laughs> Any uh, other uh, yeah. comments? Yes. May I just uh, add on? I think, you know, in a way, perhaps it's not for me to say, but I think it's a little bit, it could, it could be viewed as a little bit of an indictment on the airports by the very fact that I don't see anybody else from any airports apart from myself here today. Um, having said that, I think our own experience is that we brought that proposition to the flag carrier to say, look, You've got all the front-end passengers. Let's make the shopping experience more, more convenient for them. And they came up with 101 reasons why it was not able to be done just at that point in time yet. So it's not always, I think, about the airport trying to say no. In our experience, we've tried to bring it as well. And lo and behold, Unfortunately, it may be that one of our overseas airports would be able to introduce this before our home airports. But as long as it's good for the consumer, I'm fine. Uh, there are a number of questions. I think Mike was uh, the, one of the first ones. Go ahead, Mike. And then we've got two more. I just want to use Kim's uh, answer to me as a opportunity to make a very general point, which I think is very important. No one believes more in the value of competitive markets, I think, than I do. But understand, markets are not always in, in equilibrium. In fact, they are usually not in equilibrium. They tend toward equilibrium. And in fact, what we have been discussing for two days is what an equilibrium should look like. There are a variety of pricing models out there. There are a variety of marketing models out there. And at any given moment, the, the fact that one exists and has not died yet does not prove that it's the optimum model even for that situation. So to take Neville, Neville's main point, airport retailing, in my opinion, is in a flat part of an S-curve looking for a new S-curve. Yeah. The fact that most airport shops price the way they do does not suggest that that's an ultimate equilibrium. It only suggests that that's what has, for the moment, become an accepted model, like the gas station model before Shell went to 7-Eleven or, or anything else. I was arguing that the retail model at airports is becoming obsolete outside airports, and that, therefore, the fact that you see on the concourse a set of prices should not make you assume that they are the correct prices. By the way, <laughs> if the airport charge, you say, well, we should be sharing our, our revenues with the airport, but they're a monopoly provider, and they might decide that the price that they should charge, if they weren't constrained politically or otherwise, they might price in a way that you regarded as not optimum, but they regarded op as optimum. And that takes you to a third point, which I think goes to Neville's really basic point, this is a beginning to end purchase for the customer. There is what's called the successive monopoly problem. If I have a monopoly of one step, over one step in the change, and I charge the highest price I possibly can and get away with, and then the next person down does the same thing, and then you finally do the same thing, the whole the price for the whole process 
may become uncompetitive with other alternatives for the consumer's dollar. So you should not assume that just because you're charging as much as you can, and the airport is charging as much as it can, and the airport shop is charging as much as it can, that everyone is behaving up. Uh, before I allow the panel to answer that, uh, we only have about five minutes left. There are two other questions. Could we get those two out and then we'll answer? I, I believe there's one back there somewhere. No? I thought I saw a hand. All right, then there's one over here. Go ahead. Oh, okay, there are two here. Hi, morning, Shisham with Simply Flying. Just wanted to add a bit of perspective on the Wi Fi discussion. As according to a study released yesterday, by 2020, there will be 9,000 aircraft equipped with Wi-Fi. Equipped, not with the option. By the end of this year, there would be 200 million passengers in the U.S. who would have been on a Wi-Fi equipped plane. Unfortunately, the adoption rate is 2% for the Google Wi-Fi paid service, whereas Turkish Airlines right now is experimenting with a 777, 300-plus seater, where on average, 100-plus people are connected in flight. That is 33% adoption rate for free Wi-Fi. If you learn from the airport side, which was free Fi versus P5, two uh, buckets for the last five years, when Toronto Pearson switched from Fi Fi to free Fi, their take-up rate jumped 10 times, a thousand percent, and Rogers paid for everything. So the whole Shell and 7-Eleven thing. But one of the challenges you run into is not just taking the plane out of service for three days, but also the connected passenger requires a lot more resources because if he doesn't like the food in the flight, he doesn't wait until he lands, he just takes a photo and puts it on Facebook and your flight attendant must react to that post because he's not telling her, right? So there's real-time customer service and you need to deal with that, perhaps. Um, and there are opportunities, loyalty, revenue that you can drive. Perhaps Taro, you can share your air score where you are driving loyalty from the connected passenger even offline. So just some thoughts. There's one more question behind that, and we can respond to it. Yes. Thanks. Um, talking about seamless travel, the, uh, I used to watch this cool TV program called Star Trek, and they had this like little pod-like thing that you would get inside, and somebody would beam you to where you wanted to go, and it seemed pretty seamless. I, you actually did 